All right, this is JPEG to Raw, show number 124. And tonight we have a guest that I have been following. I've had circle, him in circles in G+, for a long time. And I was just checking tonight. This, our guest tonight has almost 2.8 million followers on G+, almost 38 million uh, profile views. And tonight he's going to, we're going to cover a little bit about who Ron is and also talk about... Um, something he's involved in, some, a very special project that he's involved in that is really a, a great opportunity for all of us photographers. So, Ron, how are you? How are you? I'm doing really well, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I was just in a meeting over with the guys at uh, that special project I've been working on, so I'm really excited to talk about that a little later. Very, yeah, very good. I can't wait to get to that. But before we do, um, won't you tell us a little bit about, about who Ron is and how you got into photography? Yeah, Ron, Ron, uh, it's pretty diverse. And I, I think most photographers' stories are diverse that I've talked to. But um, I remember I had an epiphany. Uh, when I was 10 years old, I was doing a drawing of Bambi, of all things. I was just doing a drawing of Bambi. And I remember it so well. But I, when I finished the drawing, I knew in my heart that I was an artist. It wasn't the, I'm going to become an artist. It was in, right there, right at that moment, at that young age, I knew I was an artist. And I, I didn't know everything that it meant, but I, I just knew it. Yeah. And as I, I moved ahead in art, I got into high school, and in grade 10, I was encouraged to take a photography course. And uh, when I took the photography course and looked through the, the, the viewfinder of a, a, an SLR camera, the world changed. I, I had spent my whole time thinking I was going to be a painter and an illustrator. And... Um, I was in conflict. I was I was in this deep, deep conflict. How could this be that I could, you know, love photography so much? Because after all, photography is not real art. You know, that's why. <laughs> of course, I was, you know, because, well, you know. So it, it took a long time for me to to come to grips with that, and and through doing that, I became a photo restoration artist and a retoucher, and combined my skills with art, uh, with my skills in photography. Uh, and now embrace digital photography uh, and a digital darkroom and a digital studio in, in Photoshop and Lightroom to create pieces of art. Now, when you, th when you thought, you know, back in high school that you were an artist, you were thinking, I'm an artist, were you thinking that's what you would do for a living or were you thinking more of a, I'll do this as a hobby, but I still got to find a job? Well, there was, there was never anything else on, okay. on the radar. Okay. Yeah, it was. It was it? I was an artist. I was going to be an artist. Okay. Now, have you ever? Have you? Did you worry about how am I going to make money at this? Has that ever been a concern of yours? Well, it, it was more so in, in in middle years. You know, uh, when I got married and did those things, and actually, I, I left photography for a while and and did. I was a, a contractor and renovator for many years. And photography was more a hobby, and, and painting and, and drawing, and it all went by the wayside while I, I had a big family. But out of high school, there was no no other choice. I was going to college to be a famous artist, and um, yeah, that's funny how things change. But <laughs> I like to photography in a, in a voracious way after I got my first DSLR in 2007. Okay. And... Uh, after uh, getting a digital camera, again, I just, I knew that's what I wanted to do, and I began a plan to retire into it. And I can say this year that this is now what I do full-time, and um, I still do the odd, you know, friend's job in contracting, but my full-time job is photography and photography education. Okay. Now, so you, you knew from an early age that you wanted to be an artist, and, and then later you wanted to be a photographer. Did you have a certain um, uh, par portion of photography that you said, I, you know, you liked a certain thing like landscapes or uh, people or, you know, weddings or something like that, or did it not matter? Yeah, no, early on, um, I, I photographed just about every, anything, but I went immediately into weddings um, and did portraits and, and some event work because uh, I also needed to make money. And it turns out I actually enjoyed doing it. I, I thought I was going to get into it just for the money, you know. You know, Oh, yeah, I can yeah, make yeah. a few bucks every weekend. Um, but I ended up going into doing uh, wedding and portrait work because I just really enjoy engaging with people. And so it turned – it went from an idea to make money to help support myself while I was doing restoration or pursuing other things. And 
it became something I love to do. And, and uh, do you still do the weddings today? Is that still a big portion of your photography or? or Not a big portion. I, I limit it. I won't do uh, more than 10 weddings in a year, in a season. Mm -hmm. um, this year was a very low year. Um, but my focus was in online education, so I wasn't promoting weddings um, over the last year. So I, I was happy to have them go a little lower. Yeah. Uh, one of my biggest passions is in teaching and mentoring. And um, as, as I move into this, this phase in my life, it takes more than half my time. Yeah, and we're going to get in a little bit later on a uh, big project that you're working on that's very exciting. Uh, but going along those lines of, of teaching, now you've you you know you've been doing this for a, a while. Uh, do you have any advice for somebody who is now in high school who is thinking, hey, I'm an artist. I'd like to do this. You know, this is where I'd like to go with my uh, career, my future. What, you know, what advice would you have them? One of the things, and, and along that lines, one of the questions that I think a lot of people have, and one of the guys out in chat right now I know, is how do I go from where I'm at to being a full-time photographer and making money at this craft? Yeah, photography, like much of the arts, there's not always a defined path, like becoming a lawyer or becoming a doctor, where you take certain courses and get a specific education and graduate with a degree and take an internship. Um, Photography is a, a very diverse field, and it's many aspects of it are changing very rapidly. Uh, documentary photography, where where National Geographic had hundreds of staff photographers and newspapers held, you know, scores of, of full-time photographers, those jobs are gone now. That kind of photography is gone. It's not. I'm not saying that that all photography is gone. There's still a, always going to be a need for an excellent photographer, excellent portrait photographer, excellent fine art photographer. Um, the challenge in doing photography for a living is to begin to think. First of all, you have to not think of it like, oh, um, I just I'm going to do weddings because it makes money. You have to think about what's my deep passion and what's my value thread. I had someone help me with this a while back and. When I say value thread, it's what do I offer that's unique in the industry? What am I going to stand out with? And that's likely where you're going to become most successful. Um, so my advice is photography is a tough go. Um, very few people just walk into it and begin to make money. I would recommend somebody in high school or college to take a business and marketing course yeah. because they're going to become very, very helpful the more you understand the way people make purchasing decisions. Yeah, that's great advice. Yeah, we've talked about that a lot. You need to have the business side if you want to make a living at this. Yeah, it took me years to figure that out. In high school, I filled my agenda with art courses and drawing courses and photography courses, and I, I didn't care about business courses. And um, years later, I, I immersed myself in understanding marketing and purchasing behavior because uh, photography is a luxury, and, yeah. and in, in order to sell it well, you have to understand your market. Yeah. And, you know, uh, sometimes I hear from some of our, our listeners is that, you know, there's, there's already a number of wedding photographers in my market. My market's not that big. So, and, you know, and I think a lot of us have faced this in different aspects of our life. There's already someone doing that, you know. So how, any thoughts on how to approach something that's, you know, there's really nothing no one else is already not doing, if that's not to me double more, negative. More less, that's true. You know, everything's, yeah. everything's been done in some way. Uh, at some point over the past. A lot of the most successful photographers I know um, specialize and define what their market is, define their ideal client, and then spend time marketing to that ideal client. And that's assuming that your work is already half decent. You don't have to be the best photographer in the world to have great clients. There's people making great money doing um, s selling digital files and having a package that sustains them and doing a higher volume. There's other people making fantastic money, doing fewer weddings, and, and hitting a more specified market where, the, where you're competing with much fewer people. And so um, room in any market to break in. If you're producing good work and you deliver more than you promise. Yeah. Um, so Stephen has a question out there that as I know some people struggle with. Is He literally enjoys shooting everything. He loves everything about photography and shooting every subject. And so he's having a real tough time uh, getting a niche and you know, narrowing down and, and honing his skills on, and I'm reading a little bit into what he wrote here, honing his yeah. skills into one, 
or two or three different uh, specialties. What, any advice for, for him? Yeah, th this is a, a, actually a topic I love to talk about. And um, I, I do, I, I run mentorships uh, on my own for, for individuals and small groups. And one of the mentorships I run is called Finding Your Voice. And it's a bit of a misnomer, I'll be honest, uh, because I think that what I do in that program is help people identify what finding your voice means. Not that they're going to find their voice in one six-week program. They're going to understand the path to finding your voice. Um, my first question to people like that is, is, is it important for them to specialize? Often the decision to specialize comes out of a need to find a market. Mm -hmm. But if he loves photography, he loves what he's doing, or she or whoever, you know, is asking that question, your voice, your style, where you arrive, you arrive at it by doing just what you're doing, by exploring the world first. It's very rare that someone starts photographing, you know, tin cups from China and then becomes the best tin cup photographer, you know, in the world at that one thing. The journey starts with experimenting and then bringing all your experience with you as you do find what really makes your heart sing. Okay, very good. Now, uh, speaking of that, what what makes you, when, what is your favorite thing today to, to photograph? What, do you, what gets you going, Ron? I have two favorite things to photograph, and both of them have to do with the moment. You know, we, we heard, I guess it was uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson said, uh, talked about or wrote a book, I believe, about the decisive moment. And in my life, I didn't even know about that book when I, when I coined my own phrase called The Honest Moment. And I love to photograph people, but more than just capture um, what they look like, I want to capture who they are. And so that comes at the honest moment where the camera disappears. And so the, the, the first answer is I love to photograph people and I love to arrive at that moment. When anybody who looks at that image that has any familiarity with the person says, wow, that's really them. And the other thing I love to photograph, as, as I see kind of rolling in the background where you're sitting there, is um, kind of the fine art outdoor photography. I won't say just landscape. But I love to photograph um, my outdoor world and then infuse it with my own artistic character. Okay. And that's a good transition into my next question. Is uh, As you got into photography, uh, I know now you do a show, and for everybody who doesn't know this, you do a, a Photoshop show. Called, yes. I think it's called The Photoshop Show. It is called The <laughs> Photoshop Show, yeah. And we uh, do that through the... Yeah. So uh, were you an early embracer of Photoshop? Were you... An early adopter of Photoshop? No, no, I was not. <laughs> I, I ran a, I actually taught at the local local college, and I used to teach a course, um, uh, continuing education course, part of the photography program at Humber College in uh, photo restoration and retouching. And studios from around the area would send their, their uh, retouching students there, and they would learn to retouch and go back and work for the studios. And uh, somebody had been working on these different programs, and, and somebody said to me, oh, aren't you worried about Photoshop taking over your job? And I said, oh, they're years out. They're not going to come close to what I can do in my dark room and in my, with my airbrush, you know? <laughs> Six months from that conversation, I was out of business in the hand <laughs> art yeah. area of the art. And I actually, I left at that point. That's when I transitioned into contracting and left the industry for a while. And um, in hindsight, I would have been really wise to embrace it. But at the time... Um, I just, I just didn't, I didn't want to sit in front of a computer doing that. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's a lot of things are like that with, with us. Whenever something new comes along, you know, maybe as we get, we get older, I don't feel I do this. And, I, you know, obviously you're not now with Photoshop, but it's, it's sometimes hard to embrace those new technologies. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And I did come around. I do embrace them fully. And I, I do do the show with uh, Jan Kabili called the Photoshop show. And we've done that now for over two years. And uh, I embrace Photoshop as my digital studio. Yeah, and and so you you now probably uh, somewhat of an expert in Photoshop, uh, at least more so than me. Uh, what where do you see that going? Where do you see this tool going in the future with Photoshop? Wow, Photoshop is a huge um, 
program and, and not just with Photoshop, but with their connected programs, they're at the cutting edge of both still and moving image um, photography and motion um, work. Um, I see photography itself and Photoshop being part of that because Photoshop ha does integrate doing video mm -hmm. uh, right into the platform. It's not as robust as Premiere, one of their other programs. But I see in the, in the near future our ability to shoot extremely high resolution video and just literally pluck the perfect image moment out of that series of images. Like you have 60 frame per second, you know, super high res cameras, you're not going to be taking the still image as much. And it's actually a little scary as a photographer yeah. because I'm so focused on moving to that moment. But that moment becomes one of many passing in time. And uh, yeah, that's where I see photography and Photoshop going is the ability to, to kind of extract that image from a series of images and work on that. I agree with that. I always thought about that because uh, you ever try to pull a video out of a picture and, or a picture out of a video and it's always terrible. You say, wow, this is not there. But I remember when I, uh, when I switched over to digital photography, I think it was 2005, I remember years before that saying, no, I'm not leaving film. I, I'm staying here and uh, film is never going anywhere. Digital never catch up with it. And you know what? I bought my camera in 05 and I have not taken another film shot since yeah. then. And uh, you're right, that's exactly what's going to happen. Video is going to get to the point where the, it's going to come to the, you'll be able to just pick that picture. I mean, you talk about spray and pray, it's almost what it'll be instead. Yeah, yeah. And, and like you said, Ron, it's a little bit scary, um, you know, especially if you're wanting to make a living out of photography. It's a big paradigm shift. The Kodak Brownie was a paradigm shift. Mm hmm until the Kodak Brownie came along, the only way to get a great picture of your family was to pay a photographer who was also a chemist and, and had a big studio and had a big dark room uh, to produce a beautiful heirloom piece of work for you. Um, the Brownie was a paradigm shift. It changed photography. And I'm sure the person that was doing those beautiful heirloom prints was scared. True, You're right. Yeah, and it's going to, I mean, it's just a shift. And all these things are changes that we either embrace or we reject. And um, well, I think, I've learned in life it's better to embrace it. <laughs> that's true. And, and probably one of the last things uh, that they can, uh, technology can take over is the creative side. You know, as I'm looking through some of the images that we're showing here, you know, maybe if you had a camera that was shooting 60 frames a second in high resolution, just spraying everywhere, you could have got some of these. Um, but it's the, your creative skills that got this, not necessarily the camera. The camera was just able to capture what you saw, uh, and then, you know, you edited it to your liking. But it was your creative skills that actually produced the shot. And that's, that's maybe the last bastion that technology is going to have to tackle. Yeah, th this is an area, and... Um our creativity, we're all creative. Everyone, everyone is creative. Whether you think you're, you're never going to be an artist and you can't draw or you're never going to be a professional photographer, I don't, whatever your thoughts or your self-talk are, you're creative. You were born creative. We learn to be uncreative as we grow older. Um, and I guess our creativity, I don't know if a machine, if an algorithm, if, if a computer is ever going to be able to replicate a person's creativity because it's born out of experience. Everything we bring to us at the moment we're taking pictures is part of our creativity. Uh, we can become more open to it. One of the things I love to do, I, I say, but one of the unique gifts is to help people unlock that creativity that's already within them. And when I do mentorships and I teach, that's what I love to do. I don't, I, I can teach people how to use a camera and how to set an f-stop, but I'd rather teach a person how to see. Yeah, 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 I agree. Um, okay, so what was my next? Oh, um, you, I know you, I mentioned in the first part of the show that you're huge on Google+. Plus. I mean, you're two yeah. point, two, almost 2.8 million followers, almost 38 million um, profile views, which is just humongous. Uh, is that your main social outlet uh, as a photographer and I guess just in, in general? Yes. Um, Google Plus, I, you know, I, I kind of wax uh, a little bit poetic or I, I get a little misty-eyed. It changed my life. Um, it gave me the opportunity to engage with 
other photographers on the same journey I was on, and the community quickly grew. Uh, it, we uh, we got together as a group and there was something about the way the platform worked that allowed us to build these very strong connections. There were meetups happening, local and far away. Uh, we started to create, um, even before we were able to do what are called communities on Google+, we started to create communities just using the ability to, to put people in specific circles. Um, when Hangouts came out, uh, there was a small group of us that pioneered doing these types of shows on Google+, Plus, where we were able to have a small group of people within the Hangout and then broadcast to a larger audience. Um, and so we started to do that, and that the, you know, the, the, the following started to grow from there. As I began to invest in that platform uh, heavily, um, uh, after uh, things went along, I think I was at about 40,000 followers organically at that time. Uh, Google approached me and asked me if I'd like to be part of their getting started list to help people get going on Google+. And I said, sure. And, and one of the benefits of being on the getting started list is, is that you do gain followers at a much more rapid rate. Mm -hmm. Much like, you know, uh, Facebook has a suggested users and, yeah. you know. Uh, Google did something at the beginning that was really unusual and is they, they took a grassroots approach and didn't just find superstars, they found people who are really active in the community and really committed to uh, promoting it. And, and plus, you, you share a, a lot on, on Google+, and that helps out too. I mean, that's yeah. what got you the original 40,000 was, yeah. you know, you're sharing there. Yeah, sharing, uh, commenting, and, and engaging with people around the world. It was, a, it was a wonderful new world that had opened up. I had only just gotten familiar with online social networking I was I was really uh, before Google plus I was at arm's length from it I didn't really trust it and uh, I really changed my tune now well great I, and that's how I found you so it's it's uh, and I, you know I, I love Google plus too um, so you know going into the next thing you, you you've made you've posted so much there you've shared so much there you've actually you now uh, and you talked about this earlier a big part of your photography now is education you're doing a lot of of education and helping other photographers, which is, you know, I, I love how this industry, there's so many people in this industry who are, uh, you know, the, uh, people who can be their competitors someday, but they're yeah. very open and very helpful to each other. And you've been a huge, with your Photoshop show and other things that you do, a huge benefit and a huge asset to photographers. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into the educational part of photography? Yeah, I, I've always, uh, been passionate about teaching. I, I've always taught, even in, in my roles when I was doing contracting, I was always leading crews or teaching crew leaders. In volunteer opportunities, I would be shift leaders or it, it's just built into my character. I, I think um, anybody can be a guide or a mentor. And I think some people, though, they're kind of, they're hardwired to it. And I think that's me. I was, I was hardwired to it. So when the opportunity came to think about how I was going to move into uh, this next phase in my life when I, when I didn't want to be, a, I want to be an artist. And I asked myself this question, uh, and this goes back about 10 or 12 years ago. I was in a bad place, really. I had worked myself uh, into illness, and I couldn't work for a while. And I sat down with my wife, and I asked myself, or we asked ourselves the question, when was I most happy? Mm -hmm. And the answer was when I was teaching and when I was photographing. And that had, you know, right when we were first married, I was working at the college, Photoshop hadn't taken things over, I was doing weddings, I was doing portraits, I was the happiest guy in the world. And I said, then that's my plan. I'm going to move into that, and that's what I'm going to retire into. And I began doing that a number of years ago. Google Plus accelerated that in that I, I had a, a, a rapidly growing worldwide audience that really wanted to get better at their craft. And I had that that unique gift that I could help people draw it out of them. And it was it was just a nice match. So um, to try and compress it, it got involved in the G Plus Mentorship Program for Photographers. Um, there was a few people online that thought it'd be a great idea to pass on their knowledge to other photographers and created this little mentorship thing. And um, it eventually got passed down to myself and Robin Griggs Wood, and we developed it into a more robust program. 
And, and that also led to me uh, being invited to become one of the Inception Masters at the Arcanum, which is uh, uh, Trey Ratcliffe's brainchild, where he wanted to take that idea of the online mentorship community that we developed, and he saw a bigger vision for it, a way to scale it worldwide. And, our, and so I became involved in that too. I'm going to pull up the Arcanum okay. now, so uh, people can see how I have the web page pulled up here. Um, Ar Arcanum, I said it right, I think. Arcanum, yeah. Arcanum, yes. <laughs> I got close enough yeah. to it. Um, <laughs> and for people who can't who can't spell that, like uh, or spelling challenge, is A R, or it's the T H E, A R C A N U M dot com, right? Yeah. The Arcanum.com. That's right. And I have it here. I can't play this video because uh, YouTube will kick me off right in the middle of the stream because it has some, some nice uh, music that goes along with it. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and so if you go there, it's a very nice, very professionally done uh, intro video. And I would suggest that you, you, know, you go there to that site and, and look it up and, and watch the video. But won't you, won't you tell us a little bit more about what the Arcanum is and why me as a photographer are, uh, should be interested in something like that? The Arcanum is a learning platform, and it's based on the ancient model of master and apprentice. But instead of one master and one apprentice, they've scaled it in a way, much like we ran our G Plus mentorship programs, to be able to invite uh, 20 apprentices to be in what we call a cohort. And a cohort is simply an online community of like-minded photographers that are learning together under the guidance of a master. And so I have a, a cohort of, I actually have 24 apprentices that I'm teaching currently, and I bring them through a process of leveling up their skills through very tangible um, goals. And when they level up after, after they go from one to nine and they hit number 10, they move into a new sphere and then they move from 11 to 19 and move into a new sphere. So it's a process of hitting levels and moving up in spheres to advance your photography. Okay. And um, it, so is this something that I need to be a certain skill level to get involved in this? If I'm, if I'm wanting to go there and, and find a master to help train me? Is this something I need to be at a certain the, skill level? Yeah, the, the model is really unique. And this is what I love about the online learning model that, that has been developed and is now uh, being used by the Arcanum is that each master brings with him uh, a unique perspective or gifts or uh, say one's a specialist at landscape, one's a specialist at architecture, say one's a specialist at, uh, you know, creativity and, and artistic, you know, whatever. The Arcanum allows the master to, to develop his own ideal mentorship under the umbrella or, or the, under the structure, the umbrella structure of the Arcanum's levels and spheres. And so while it has guidelines about leveling up and hitting benchmarks, the actual curriculum is pretty general. So for example, I have people that have been shooting for one year and are, are fairly new with their cameras. And I have people that have been shooting for many, many years and are quite advanced in the same cohort learning together. It's, a, it's, an amazing, um, it's an amazing thing to be involved in. Part of the community learning model is that I am not micromanaging a classroom where I'm responsible to answer every question, be at every post, be over everyone's shoulder. My job is really a guide to see the individual path of a person and help move them along it. Okay. The community becomes a growing community of people that help each other it's a wonderful process so so now in in the group what what did you call the group again a cohort a cohort in a cohort how many people might be in that cohort the, the we recommend in the arcanum about 20 people makes an ideal cohort okay and that number is is kind of arrived at because in my own experience and, and i believe trays and curtis and peters who developed it as well the online community kind of hits this magic 15 to 20 people and it self-perpetuate. It, it becomes very engaging. People make comments on each other's work. They support one another and they encourage one another. They help answer each other's questions. And so that became kind of a benchmark. And as it got tested in beta, it became kind of a, a, a good number for most people. Not every master has to have 20 
apprentices. Some have more and some have less. Okay. But it's a good starting point. So in, in the, um, the cohort, uh, if you have 20, you only have one cohort as a master, right? The, the, that's a very good question. Um, masters will start out with a foundation cohort okay. at a foundation sphere. The model that's being generated is one that in the future, if somebody found that this fit them as a lifestyle, in the future could become a full-time mentor within the Arcanum and take on, say, four cohorts and and treat that as uh, their primary job. And Trey and Peter and Curtis, that's Trey Ratcliffe, uh, Peter Giordano and Curtis. Um, uh, <laughs> sorry, I just drew a blank. Yeah, and I'm not going to be able to help you. Have it online. <laughs> Uh, but we'll, we'll look it up, and I'll have the, show, the links there, too. So, so anyway, uh, Curtis Simmons. Um, Curtis Simmons, okay. Their, their vision, their North Star for the Arcanum is, is not only to be one of the most innovative and life-changing education experiences for the apprentice, but also be a model that fits uh, with people who have a heart of a master or mentor in that they can, they can have it as a part-time, one-cohort kind of thing that they keep uh, moving along, or they can move into it as a full-time uh, profession. It's it's a beautiful vision that they have. Okay. Now, how how do you handle? Let's say in your cohort, let's say it's a 20, 20 people in a cohort, um, people of various skill levels. Because if you think back to like a normal high school class, or even a, uh, let's say high school class, um, someone who's slow is going to hold back the whole class. How do you handle the different skill levels? Excellent. That's a great question because um, I, I was just answering this earlier. I have people literally at level one because someone has joined uh, yesterday or today in my cohort. And I have people at level 12 within the first two spheres in my one cohort. Um, the way it's designed is there's not an expectation for each apprentice to hand in their level one on a certain date. They work at their own pace. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a subscription-based model, and so a person determines their pace based on, number one, their availability, and number two, how much they feel their investment is being rewarded. If you pay into a subscription and you don't use it, you're not going to pay for it very long. Mm -hmm. And so people tend to uh, level up at a fairly consistent rate, but there's no expectation for each apprentice to hit hit their goals at the same time. Each level is designed um, at, a, at an individual level. So the person will, uh, let's say at, at level one can be really simple, can be to submit you know, five images that represent where you are now in photography and, and tell me about those images. So they do that. Then I can comment and I get to know that person. As they level up, I get to know each apprentice more. By the time they hit level 10, I know pretty well what path they're on and can help direct that path, but they really determine it. I don't. They want to go into this or that, or they want to improve in this or that. They're telling me that, and I'm guiding them in the process. Now, do, when, we, when you start a cohort, when, um, do, does everybody come in at the same time, uh, and or do we all start off at level one? Yes, you all start off at level one, um, but not everybody has to come in at the same time. When I started my cohort, I invited my 20 in pretty much right away. So it got really busy really fast, and then after a few weeks, it, it leveled off and became very manageable. Okay. But that first few weeks was pretty crazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I tell new masters coming in, it might be a great idea to invite five in and then you know, get them up to level one by invite another five, invite another five you know, over the course of a, a few weeks so that it's not all at once. Everybody's hitting level one, you know, two days later. So, yeah, I, it, um, there's no expectation for you to, to fill your cohort with 20 the first day you do it. It would probably be wiser to, to have them in at a regular basis over the first couple or three weeks. Okay. And as a master, how often are you having to, now that you've got a, you know, 20 people or, or whatever, I'm, I'm using 20 as an example, how yeah. often are you having to interact with someone on, in your cohort? Is it a daily, every day you're doing something with somebody? I put aside time every day. Um, it's, it's a part-time 
work for me. That as a master in the arcanum, it, it's not something that that we do only because we love it. There's a there's a revenue model that the guys have developed, and we're moving into now that we're out of beta, and so it's going to be uh, also financially rewarding. And for that, I set aside time. I treat it like part of my job. Okay. And so for my cohort, and I'll just be really clear, I've set aside between 20 and 30 hours a month okay. uh, to interact with them. It turns out being more, though, because when I do a photo walk, the people who are local, they join in. You know, um, If I'm doing a workshop, you know, one or two of them might join that workshop. So I engage with them. But the model, um, it builds relationships. It's hard to explain in words community, online community-based learning and how it builds in the factor of relationship. That, that's the hard one to articulate. But you have a whole group of people that are like-minded that already were on social media, so they get that part of it. They get the social sharing part. And now they're learning together and they're leveling up their skills at a rate that they couldn't have done normally now, I don't want to put down other education models, but just watching, you know, video one, video two, video three on an education site it isn't necessarily the best way people can learn. Mm -hmm. uh, some people need the, the guidance and the direction that this model gives them. And so let's, let me step back a second. So you, you are a master at uh, the Arcanum, and how do you select your your uh, cohort because I'm looking out there and I think there's a, a waiting list now it's so popular there's a waiting list of people who want to find a master right there is a waiting list uh, the next thing that makes the arcanum exceptionally unique is the master chooses their apprentices not the other way around um, and what that does is it allows me when I became a master to go into what they call the antechamber which is basically the the registration room where people are saying, I'd love to be part of this. Can you select me as an apprentice? And, and I look at their profile and what they've written about themselves, and I try to identify people that would fit within my model. For example, I love to teach people about creativity, about expanding their creative vision, and about getting unstuck if they find themselves kind of stuck about what to go forward with. So I looked for keywords. In, in, in the profiles like stuck or rut or creative or creativity. And, and there's many other criteria, but that's how I looked for mine. And every master is going to approach it differently. Everybody's going to uh, invite people differently. I actually created a, a post on Google Plus and said, I've been accepted or invited to be a master, one of the first masters in the Arcanum. Um, is, is there anybody of my former students that thinks they might like to join that model? And so immediately I, I had a number of students that I could bring in with me that already were experienced at community learning. Some new masters may not have that, and they're, they're drawing from the, the pool of the waiting list, um, and they're building their cohorts that way. Okay. And uh, do, you, do you know how, much, how long the waiting list is? If, if someone out there listening would like to join, um, is there any way to, to, to know how long they're going to have to wait? I imagine you're looking for more masters, too, to help. Yeah. Um, I'll answer that in, in two, two parts. One is um, because it's a unique model, we want to be patient and not rush the process and, and bring on the right masters, the masters that are invested because this is what they were wired for. Um, you want people that love the idea of an online community and want to give back. And that creates a great culture because the Arcana, more than just a learning platform, is a culture and a community on a bigger scale. I, I can see this going into the thousands or ten thousands of people and moving way outside photography and covering the arts and music and, and becoming a learning model that we haven't seen before. It's never been possible. It's a worldwide learning model that doesn't have these walled limits. Um, and so the waiting list, it's, it's hard to say exactly because you're being selected. You might put your application in tomorrow and be picked in a day or a week or maybe not for a month. One of the things I'm doing is um, I've been brought on board as, what's, uh, uh, in, as a master trainer. I'm running a fast track community and it just began and that community is dedicated 
to taking already experienced teachers that are interested in the Arcanum, that have been hand-selected and have been invited to fast-track, and I bring them up to speed with the platform so that they can start their own cohorts. The goal is to begin to scale this larger over the next year so that the waiting list can begin to dwindle. But we foresee the waiting list, as more people experience this and talk about it, the waiting list grows. Because mm. people say, oh, this sounds awesome. I want yeah, to be part of it. Exactly. And I'm not saying that just because I, I, you know, I'm a teacher, but it is awesome. And it is unique. And, and people are learning at a rate that you would rarely see in, in other uh, types of learning environments. And so I, I can't answer that. I can't say it's a day or a week or a year. I can say the best way to get selected as an apprentice is to be thorough in filling out your application and be honest. Because the masters that are going in there and choosing from that are looking for people that have been thorough and honest and fit with them. Okay, okay. And so with that, since the masters are choosing someone the way you said, it's not necessarily a first come, first serve. So if you look, mm -hmm. if you look at the list and you're discouraged, it shouldn't discourage you from signing up because you don't know you may get choos chosen sooner. That's right. And, and, and as, uh, like I say, with a, a well-filled out um, application in the Arcanum, there's a much better chance that you'll be... Um, selected and yeah it won't put you behind or ahead of anybody at the time you apply you're you're in the same boat as everyone else once you've put in an application what makes you difference is your application and that you connect with the master if, if you're in there and you want to learn portrait photography don't put on your profile i want to learn portrait photography and landscape photography and general photography and product photography when a master goes in to look and sees that you've put seven things as your as your uh, your favorite things, they they're going to wonder if you if they fit you. Right. So really, put down what your strong stuff is. Okay. And That's my uh, my advice, anyway. So can you give us some outside of you? We know Ron is a master. Who are some of the other masters that are out there? Um, well, there's there's lots of them. We have right currently we have over twenty five masters and between four and five hundred apprentices, and that grows every day. Okay. Um, I'm in the process of bringing up new masters, and, and there's names you'll recognize. I, I mean, Jan Kabili is a master, and Karen Hutton's a master, mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, Valerie Desardin is a great street photographer who's a master. Uh, Verena Patel is a master. She runs a very vibrant cohort. In fact, in her cohort, the very first level 20 um, apprentice graduated just uh, two weeks ago, last week. Wow. So the Arcanum's first uh, level Sphere one level twenty apprentice uh, hit that mark and and is, uh, put their hand up and said, "I think I'd be interested in being a master in the Arcanum." So what what does that mean when I when when someone hits level twenty and graduates? Does that mean they're now ready to be a master, or or what what does that really Sometimes mean? Sometimes it can mean that. Well, the way it is right now, and you have to understand that this is new, yeah. And we're growing with it, so we don't have all the answers. Peter and, and Trey and Curtis don't have all the answers. They have their North Star. Mm -hmm. And we're building it as we go. And the masters and apprentices are creating this ultimate learning platform together. When you get to that sphere one, level 20, so you have the foundation sphere, then sphere one, then there'll be sphere two and three and on. At sphere one, level 20, right now there's three choices. One is to go back to the antechamber and wait for a master to pick you for sphere two in a more specialized way. To decide to put your hand up and say, I think I might be able to be a master. And at that point, you would, you would be recommended as a master. First, of course, you'd have to get a recommendation from your master to be able to do that. And then you could begin a candidate program that brings you up to, you know, uh, educate you as what your, your goal or your tasks would be as a master. I mean, you can always leave the Arcanum at that point. I would never, you know, uh, maybe it doesn't fit you. Maybe it's not ideal. Maybe you committed to the first 20 levels to try it out and said, okay, it's not for me. And then I think there's going to be an opportunity, depending on the masters and how they carry on, like a lot of my cohort has asked is, can I stay on with you? And I, I believe the answer to that question for a lot of masters is going to, is going to be yes. You can, you can 
stay on with me and we're going to specialize more into sphere two together and they'll bring on some new apprentices that want to specialize as well yeah there's a three there was a lesson right there the you don't have to have all the answers uh before you start something you know you you have a vision you have an idea of where you want to go uh you have the drive to do it and this is not just you know the arcanum this is uh, a lot of things uh but don't wait to have all the answers before you start that's great advice yeah. yeah And I got that from what you y'all just said. You don't have all the answers on exactly how you're going to do this. You're going to tweak it over time. But you have the vision. You have the the north stars. You said your 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 goal in mind, uh, and and you'll tweak it as you go. Yeah, and, and what one of the things that makes this so so incredible is the fact that each cohort is a unique, almost like a living, it is a living community, like an organism. And the master, the master molded into his ideal learning environment based on the feedback of the apprentices. And so at, both at the cohort level and then a broader level, and then then the complete umbrella, it's kind of bottom up. The the, the bottom is is educating the top on, on the best way to move this forward. And uh, the, for that reason, changes happen quickly. And, and, and anytime there's a little bit of you know, maybe goes off track here or there, it gets back on track immediately. It's not like it takes ages to, you know, to get it back to that North Star. It happens right away. It's very responsive. Yeah, and, and so now let's, let's say you pick me as a, uh, as a member of the cohort. What should I expect? What, is, what, is, what am I going to do? What do, I, do I have assignments? How do I move up in levels? Yeah, it, when you come in, I would send you an invite, you would accept my invite, and then I would send you an invitation to the private community. So now you're going to have a profile on thearcanum.com, and you're going to get an invite to my private Google Plus community, which is my cohort. And the first thing I'm going to ask of you is to poke around, to read a few things, and to make an introductory post. Um, You know, who you are, how long you've been shooting, hi everyone, this is me. And... um, and then look at what is level one, and that's to upload, you know, your your five images with your introduction, uh, and, and you 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 do that correctly, and you've hit level one, and I say, you get a post, congratulations, you've hit all the benchmarks for level one. Let's work towards level two, and level two is this, and so you'll have access to what level two is, and you'll work towards that, and. The, the great thing about the master is the more you level up, the more I as a master can refine the level to be less general. Okay. So the first levels are fairly general. Everybody's pretty much the same. By the time we're in, you know, the, the past the foundation sphere, so, you know, your level one to nine is foundation level. Okay. You enter sphere one. I'm able to give you not just the general arcanum uh, level requirement for level 11, but I add to it your direction, what we're working on together as a, as a student. Now, when I post this is in, the, in the private community, is that something that the other members of the cohort are seeing and they're, yeah. they're commenting on it and are able to, to um, give me guidance? Yeah. The power of community-style education, this community model that's been developed, is that your cohort is – is responsible to help you grow, just like you're responsible to them. It's a relationship, and as much as I'm responsible to help guide you, they're responsible to come alongside and encourage you. When you have a question, I'm not always the one that has the the answer right away. Very often, there's somebody in the cohort that's already got the answer, may have had it before you joined, and you say, oh, how do I do this, or I'm confused about that, and bing, pop down into your post. Mm-hmm. And that crowdsourcing of of knowledge is powerful, very powerful. Right. No, that that's that's you know we see that a lot in, in just a, the social media itself, Facebook, yeah. Google Plus, all those kind of things. The power of of the the social media and have it in such a fine group with all the same common goal is uh is incredible so one thing we hadn't talked about is the cost what does this cost what kind of commitment am i making and i know i know you did a post um on your on your 
website, and we'll have the links to this for everybody for later, but it's uh, why the Arcano. Yeah. I put out that post because I was getting that question a lot. Is it worth it? Like people would say, is it worth it? And, and in one sense, I can't answer that question. Obviously, you have to answer that question. Uh, the cost, you'll see on the website, is $79 a month. It's a subscription-based model. And what that gives you is access to the your cohort community and to the lessons and the leveling. It gives you an account on the Arcanum.com. It gives you access to what we have. We have what's called the Grand Library, which is a growing, ever-growing collection of video content that the masters contribute to. For example, I have videos in there on focus stacking, and I have videos in there uh, on. Uh, I have a couple of things in, in there, but each master puts in content in response to the needs of their cohort, and so it's a growing library of fantastic content, world-class content along with the ability to watch other cohorts' uh, critiques at their critique levels. One of the levels we have uh, is, is you hit the critique level in every sphere. Okay. And that's where you and the master have a one-on-one -on -one and you have a critique and, and you get very solid uh, feedback that gives you actionable goals to work toward. Um, it's That's why I say it's such a different model because you're getting this there's community involvement, but you're also getting this this direction from from your mentor in the cohort. So at seventy nine dollars a month, there's no minimum subscription. And if you find after you've done it for a, for a month or two that it, it's not fit for you, there's no hard feelings. In fact, if you don't feel it's a fit, I'm happy if you say that to me and we don't we don't carry on because yeah. you need to find what's right for you. And yeah. I'm as a responsible mentor. That's my my job is to say, yeah, you know what? Maybe this isn't the best thing for you. Exactly. You know, and seventy nine seventy nine dollars a month. You think about that, and you think about there's there's lots of great uh, workshops out there. There's lots of workshops that people could take out there. You know, maybe a workshop is the weekend, the, the two or three days of a weekend, or maybe a little bit longer. And you could easily spend hundreds of dollars, if not thousand dollars or more, on something like a workshop. And there's value in those. I don't want to discount the workshops. There's there's value in oh, there's great in, value in, 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 in those in the workshop in those workshops. But you know, this you for a year, seventy nine dollars a a month is less than a thousand dollars a year. Uh, that is, you know, a, a weekend workshop in many cases, uh, and you're getting a year's worth of, of feedback and, act, and access to a small community and uh, a, a master. So, seventy-nine dollars a month is a great deal, I think. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up too, because if you look at the the typical model, the education model today, you have a, a site um, that has videos, and maybe they're they're organized and they're well laid out. And they're excellently done, and they, they have great content. And then, so you subscribe, and maybe it's less than 70, probably is less than $79 a month. But there's nobody to be accountable to, and it's subject-driven. And so you're on that one set of videos, and probably maybe you'll get to the end of it, and maybe you won't before you choose another subject. And then you're on the net, and you're checking out YouTube, and then you're starting to bounce around, and, and you start getting what, what I call you know, social noise. Mm -hmm. The master's role is to help quiet the noise and put you on a solid path, you know. Um, and so this educational model moves away from the typical video subscription site and has great value. It also moves beyond, and I love the live workshop. I do live workshops. I love the one-on-one. -on -one. I love the hands-on. But this, when you've left that workshop, the amount of retention you have diminishes rapidly from what you learn. Whereas this style of continual subscription contact with your group, the, the retention, the learning curve is solid. It's not really faster than drop. It's just a solid climb. Mm -hmm. And it, it's the difference. It, to me, it makes it one of the best education models I've ever seen. Okay, uh, and, and you know, um, you say it's a solid climb, but I'm sure there's maybe you haven't been doing this long enough. I don't know, but there's got to be a point where some people maybe going from level one to level two is fairly easy. It's 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 
you know, but there's a certain point where you, <laughs> certain point where you hit and you go, you, you maybe you're there a little bit longer than most levels before you go to the next one. You know, what is that? You know, not that I'm a runner, you, if you can't tell by my body, but where runners kind of hit a wall and then they push past that and go on. Do you, is there any level like that uh, in in this where maybe a photographer kind of hits a little bit of a wall? I hope so. The the creative process cannot be full on all the time. Right. That's not possible. The creative process is out of your comfort zone, does involve angst, and you need to, to climb and level and climb and level. So when I say, you know, it's a it's an incline, it's just not that that up and then down and then you're you're done. It it really is this all the way but it's solid it's not the climb and drop in my own cohort for example i know that level five and level 11 many many students have hit that wall at level five and level 11 because at level five at level four they do their critique and usually they've they've hit a new level by that time by level four they do their first critique and now they feel the pressure of having to do better work than they did last week and so they they go through a bit of that angst. They hit that wall, and I don't I don't intervene right away. I, maybe I'm a little cruel, but I let them go through it a bit. <laughs> you need to. It's it's part of the creative process. And level eleven is the same thing. Once you you graduate the foundation sphere, you're on cloud nine. You have hit some milestones, and and you should be proud. You've really made some progress. And you hit level eleven, and it's like, well, now what am I going to do? Right? Yeah, yeah. And so you hit the wall again. And I hope that's the process that people get, but I hope they also understand they have a cohort and a mentor that can bring them through that process and they'll learn that it's okay. It's yeah. part of the process. You know, in, in my job, uh, my day job is an accountant and I've been doing this for, you know, 20 plus years, almost, almost uh, too many years. <laughs> Uh, 25 years. I can keep going. But, you know, what I have learned is the people who end up being the best uh, in my field are not the ones that I handhold and, and do just do almost everything for them and, and, and do that. It's the ones that let struggle a little bit, that let work through the problems themselves. I'm always there to help. If they, you know, I, they have their safety net, but the ones that will struggle through and find it, if you are able to do, solve it on your own, you're so much better off than if you had somebody walk you through it every step of the way. Yeah, and you'll retain it forever. Yes. When you worked out the problem on your own or with a little guidance, right. you'll retain it. Right. If, yeah. if someone holds your hand the whole way, you'll get through that, but you won't retain it. It won't right. be yours. Right, and, I'm not, you know, and you said it right. I'm not saying just let them flounder all on their own. I mean, that's not, <laughs> that's not, that's not the point. <laughs> Um, but, you know, it, letting them do some stuff on their own. Now, Stephen, I think the stream is a little bit further behind us for whatever reason tonight, but Stephen out there in chat said, and he's a guy who earlier had said he has a lot of, um, a lot of parts of photography that he loves. So I think when he filled out the, he's filled it out, I believe, the, 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 the membership, whatever, yeah. how do you say that? Uh, and he put that, he didn't put down specifics because he, he likes everything. So maybe yeah. he was too vague. Can he go back and edit that? Yeah, he can. And I recommend it because we've just released a number of changes that make the application process a little more robust, okay. and it will help you be identified easier by a potential master. So if you are listening and you have an application in and you haven't gone in recently and updated it, highly recommend that you do. Um, it will really help you be noticed by the right master. Okay, okay. Um, Very good. Yeah. Well, Ron, I can't believe it. We're already at the hour. Uh, that's just flown by. It's been a real pleasure to have you here on the show. And before we leave, I have a few more things. But uh, thank you so much for coming out tonight and sharing your your photos, uh, your history, and about uh, what you're doing with Arcanum. It's it's just fabulous. Well, I'm happy to do it. Like I say, this the longer I, I do this, and the more I see that north stretch, the vision that Trey and Peter and Curtis have. Uh, just the more excited I get about it. So I'm happy to have been here and shared. Well, thank you very much. And people can find you at ronclifford.com, right? Yeah, it's it's really simple. ronclifford.com and uh, on G+, uh, just look for Ron Clifford. I'll pop up in the orange coat. Yep. And I think if you go to ronclifford.com, you have at the top, you have your G+, uh, link. 
Uh, yeah, I do there and I do at the footer as well. Right. Your, yeah. your Pinterest, your Facebook, and your Twitter. Uh, G Plus is the place where they can find you the most. And also, I think uh, Flickr, you have some uh, amazing images yeah, over on Flickr, too. Flickr. I'm not as active. I do post there, but um, I'm very active on G Plus. I, 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 I'm committed to responding to posts there. And, um, that's that's where I engage the most. Okay, and you know, for 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 anybody out there who's thinking about signing up for the Arcanum, I would say go out and sign up. And uh, if you get accepted, have I don't know how we can work this out because it may take a while, but I would love for JPEG to Raw to pay for your first month, for who you know, first come first serve. Whoever sends the email first, do you think I do you think I can have the master email me too, just so I know that this is a uh, you know somebody I don't know emails me. Would they would they be open to that? Well, probably. How would that work? I, I mean, I'm sure it can I'd work have, out. I'd have to send them through PayPal or something. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it can work out. Yeah, I don't think that I could work something where I paid Arcanum directly. Yeah, yeah, it would probably be a reimbursement yeah. to uh, to the subscriber would be easiest. Yeah. So if if you haven't if you're not already a member, and you go and sign up, and you get accepted. Even if it's a few months from now, email me at podcast at jpegdaraw.com. First come, first one. And I'm going to do this for a thousand people. You know, our Amazon account doesn't make that kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's up to five bucks for this month. So, uh, <laughs> all right. Yeah, woo, five bucks. Um, so if you're, the, if you're the first one, email me at podcast at jpegdaraw.com and we will work something out to get you uh, reimbursement for that first, for that first month. How's that sound? And if you want that to help, awesome. if you want to help us out and having funds to do this kind of thing, because Tim and I do this for free. We don't do this for money. We do this because we enjoy, we love photography. We love meeting great people like Ron and talking about these things. Uh, and any funds we do make from our link, which is jpegdaraw.com slash Amazon, uh, any funds we do, we do things like this. We will help pay for somebody's uh, first month at Arcanum or do giveaways or contests or something like that because we're, we're not doing this for money. If you go, you got to use it every time you go to Amazon, just follow, use that link. It'll take you there. Then buy whatever you're going to buy. I think Tim bought a book or something recently. Only, I don't only know that because you told me that. Uh, so it doesn't have to be photography related. And it's not going to add any cost to your purchase. Um, that's, you know, so it's just a little bit that helps us out. And then think about joining our forums. We have a a forums, jpegdaraw.com slash forums, that I've been using for a lot of stuff. You know, if you went out there into our calendar, you would have saw that Ron was tonight. You would have saw a little bit, all the links to his website, his, his Flickr, I think I had G+, Plus, of course, and some things like that. You would have known Ron was tonight. And you can see who's coming up. Uh, and that's just on the calendar side. We also have uh, some downloads where we're doing editing contests. You know, uh, in our Facebook group and through the forums, we're doing an edit contest where we put up a raw image and then we have various people edit them. And uh, just, you know, the normal functions of a forum. Right now, really, it's just uh, kind of me out there posting because <laughs> I know people either like to be on G Plus or on Facebook. But uh, it is a great tool to be used. We use it for a lot of other things. We use it for our monthly photo contest also. So take a look. Go out there to jpegdaraw.com slash forums and join and and join me so i'm not alone out there uh if 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 you had trouble tonight and it seems like youtube every once in a while has some trouble if you had trouble tonight and hearing anything ron had to say this is recorded it will be out on youtube not the version you saw live and a slightly edited version on youtube on tivo on um gosh itunes of course in various formats and then uh, I'd like to do a special shout out to our listeners out on Stitcher and iHeartRadio, who the, the the number of followers out there have really grown lately. Um, and thank you guys for for listening. I would encourage you to come over to our page, uh, our, our website, www.jpedraw.com, and see some of the show notes, see the little bit of video, see some of the photos we talked about and some of the links that you may not get in the audio version of it. But I know a lot of you listen to it while you're driving into work or, or on the train or something like that. So I understand getting the audio version. So we, we're happy to have you guys out there uh, from Stitcher and I Heart Radio who that side of it, Tim, is growing faster than any other um, of our our avenues that we're putting it out there. And then I know we have a few, a few guys who get us on TiVo, so we uh, always appreciate those guys. Um, what else? 
we have all the links to Ron's stuff out on the website. And, oh, one, one, I wanted to mention something else. So we have a few people. I don't know if I think she just left. Dad gummit. <laughs> she was out there and chat, and now she's left. Um, so Nikki, we have a few people in our Facebook group who are, and on G Plus who have been real big help. You know, Tim, of course, is a help coming out here every every Tuesday night and doing show notes, and been doing that, gosh, since show number four. But Nikki and Gina out there in our Facebook group who are a huge help in keeping up with the, the various contests, the various challenges we do, and just the general administration out there. Nikki's added a bunch of, of um, what do you call it, in, events for the, for the hangouts, for the shows, this, this kind of stuff. She's done a lot of stuff like that. There's re been a real help. And I just want to say thank you to those two uh, and to all our members of the, of the Facebook group. You, you guys are what keep the, the show going. And we're getting close to a milestone of, of uh, 400,000, 400,000 total views slash listens of the show. So that's that's the one milestone. We'll break that this month. We'll hit 400,000 this month. Not 400,000 one month. I'm not saying that. 400,000. <laughs> uh, We're getting better. We're not getting that much better yeah, yet. We're not getting that much better. <laughs> I'd expect more than $5 on the Amazon link if we had that. But uh, that's, uh, I think, all I had to say there. And, Ron, thank you again for coming out. Everybody, we'll see you all next week. Until then, keep it raw. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.